Welcome to tonight's webinar, We're Pregnant, Now What? My name is Sharon Fitzpatrick, and I'm your moderator for tonight's webinar. Joining me is Barb Dane, RN, MS, Women's Health Nurse Practitioner. We have a full agenda for tonight, so let's get started. Barb, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Sharon. Hi, everyone. I'm Nurse Barb. I'm a Women's Health Nurse Practitioner here in the heart of Silicon Valley. I care for women who deliver their babies at El Camino Hospital, and I've been asked to share with you what I tell my patients when we talk about what they need to know when both planning for a pregnancy and when they're pregnant. So tonight's webinar is called Congratulations, We're Pregnant. Now what? I bet you have a lot of questions if you're pregnant. Now before we get started, there's a few housekeeping details we need to take care of. So if you haven't already downloaded the personal health assessment, you can do so by clicking on the link in the uh, chat box of the control panel. We also recommend that you download the resource guide with lots of helpful local healthcare resources. And there's a link for that in the chat box as well. Be sure to take notes throughout tonight's session. And we will have time at the end for some questions, but as they come up, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can toward the end. And at the end of this webinar, you'll be sent an email with a link to the two, uh, to the three previous webinars, the resource guide, as well as other very valuable tools. Today's presentation was developed by a team of experts here at El Camino Hospital, including myself. Um, so now what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about webinars one, two, and three. So if you missed our first webinar, I'm encouraging you to go back and um, take a look at it. And it's called Thinking About Getting Pregnant, What You and Your Partner Need to Know. And in that webinar, we covered how you envision your future as parents, how to improve communication as a couple, your medical and family history, vaccinations and travel, and some sleep issues and mental health. And in webinar number two, we covered nutrition, how to actually get pregnant, how to predict ovulation, how to improve fertility, men's health issues and their fertility, and when to see a specialist. In our last webinar, number three, we covered um, a lot of the prenatal testing questions that people have. We talked about when sex might be painful or sex might be impossible. We also talked uh, about same-sex couples, how to improve communication again, because that's so important and testing for genetic conditions, as well as some of the new testing options uh, that you may be familiar with. We're having a baby. Uh, your congratulations. I mean, welcome to one of the most incredible journeys of your life. Pregnancy is a time when your body will change in ways that may be difficult to imagine right now. You may feel overjoyed, worried, elated and overwhelmed all at the same time. Whether you're newly pregnant or closer to delivery, it's normal and natural to have thousands of questions. And as your pregnancy progresses, some or more of what a couple may be experiencing may be a happy surprise, a little shocking, or a little of both. In any case, this webinar has been developed to help you get the information that you need. So today, what we're going to talk about are your emotions. We're going to talk about nausea, travel, sex, what to stop, what to avoid, what to limit, when to go to the hospital, when to call your provider, some of the body changes that you'll be experiencing. We'll give you information on nutrition and a to-do list for your first trimester. And we'll also discuss what El Camino Hospital offers for moms, dads, and extended families. So if you're in the group that has not yet found an OB provider, you can use the link on the El Camino website to find a doctor. And you can find someone who speaks your language, who may um, come from the same culture that you are from. So if you are in the group who has not already chosen an OB provider, you can use the handy link 
on the El Camino website, that's find a doctor. And you can find someone who speaks your language, um, who's close by, um, and you can. So now let's talk a little bit about what you may be feeling in terms of your emotions. Um, when you first find out that you're pregnant, the question, is this really happening? It may spring to mind. And it's very normal and natural to doubt the results of your pregnancy test and take two, three, even 10 or 15. It's very, very normal. I've had patients take as many as 15 pregnancy tests because they just can't believe that they're finally pregnant. And in case you're wondering, the urine pregnancy tests that are now available over the counter at any pharmacy or drugstore are just as accurate as those that are available from any lab, your healthcare provider, any hospital or clinic. Now, there's no one right way to experience a pregnancy. You may feel elated and delighted by the news, enjoying every single aspect as your body changes and grows and your baby grows and changes and as your delivery approaches. Or you may feel a little unsure and ambivalent. It's normal to have mixed feelings, especially when you first find out for many women, every aspect of their pregnancy is magical, and for others, it can be a mixed bag of delightful surprises and difficult challenges that nobody ever warned you about. Your pregnancy and your baby will be as unique as you are. What you experience is influenced by numerous factors, including your age, your family history, any medical conditions you may have, your nutrition, whether you work, go to school, how much you exercise, your hormone levels, just to name a few. Now, I like for my patients to live in what I call the guilt-free zone. Because many times, uh, a woman may have very conflicting feelings about being pregnant, even if she's been trying for a long time to become pregnant. And you can have conflicting feelings if you don't feel well, if you're nauseated or you have challenges in your relationship or with your family, it's also normal to feel guilty if you're not as happy as you thought you would be or you're not as happy or elated as other people are when you share your news. We also live in an age where everyone's on social media and it's normal to want to compare yourself to celebrities or friends that you see online. Most people are posting only when they feel great, so don't compare yourself if you're having difficult or different emotions. After caring for women for many, many years, my advice is try to let go of any guilt or fear you might be experiencing and give yourself time to get used to the idea of being a new mom or a new dad and adding to your family. That's why you get months to prepare for your baby's arrival. If your ambivalence turns into sadness or feeling of being completely overwhelmed by your situation, do talk to your doctor, nurse practitioner, or midwife. Well, let's talk about the first 10 days of pregnancy. In the first 10 days after conception, the developing embryo travels down the fallopian tubes into the uterus. There is absolutely no contact with the mother's blood supply which means that a woman will not know she's pregnant. It's only after the embryo implants into the uterus that the pregnancy hormones are released into her system. A woman may or may not start to experience symptoms such as breast tenderness, nausea, being bloated, until one or three weeks after she's missed her period. That means also that most exposures to medications, alcohol, or any other substances that occur prior to missing your period, such as having a glass of wine at a wedding or enjoying other substances at a concert or a friend's house, these will not, these will not have any effect on the baby. But as always, if you have specific questions or concerns about any exposures to anything, do talk to your healthcare provider. So a question that comes up all the time is, how do you guys come up with these dates, with the due date and the number of weeks of pregnancies? You know, most of us grow up thinking that pregnancy lasts for nine months, when actually 
it's 40 weeks from the first day of your last menstrual period. And we know that pregnancies don't start on the first day of your last menstrual period, but it does provide a date to start calculating when ovulation and conception may have occurred, which is usually sometime between 10 and 16 days after the first day of your last period. Now, we live in a new age, right? We came up with these dates well before we ever had the technology of ultrasound that can accurately date a pregnancy. So we still use the old system, which is that pregnancy is 40 menstrual weeks, which means that when a woman is one week late for her period, she's considered five weeks pregnant. In reality, she's only been pregnant for three weeks. And this is very confusing. And yet everyone around the world calculates pregnancies based on the number of weeks from the last period. Now, if there hasn't been a period in a while, then we can use an ultrasound to measure the baby's growth to determine how far along the pregnancy is. Why do we do that? Well, it's very, very important to know how far along a pregnancy is so we can estimate the due date and determine if the baby is growing appropriately throughout the pregnancy and also to prepare for the tests that need to be done at certain times. It's also really important to know the number of weeks in case a mom goes into labor too early or too late because both situations can have very serious negative effects on a baby's health. It also helps to be able to plan for the future with a better idea of what your body and your baby will be experiencing week to week and month to month. So let's talk about your baby's growth in the first trimester. In the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, there is tremendous growth and development as one single cell multiplies and divides, forming a baby with a heartbeat, limb buds that will eventually become arms and legs, and the formation of all the major organ systems in the body. No wonder newly pregnant women are so tired. Their bodies are using as much energy every day as it takes to run about five miles. That's right, that's why you're so fatigued. And all of this development is dependent upon increasing levels of hormones that cause many of the symptoms associated with a new pregnancy, such as breast tenderness, bloating, needing to use the bathroom frequently, and of course, morning sickness and nausea. So we might as well talk about nausea and pregnancy because this is one of the very first symptoms that you may be experiencing. The good news is that not every newly pregnant mom will have nausea or morning sickness. And here's a secret that no one tells you. Morning sickness doesn't just happen in the mornings. It can happen any time, day or night, and it can last minutes, hours, or all day. I know, just the idea of saying this can make me a little queasy, so I can imagine how you're feeling. So starting at about seven to eight weeks, about two out of three newly pregnant women will feel queasy, seasick, or unable to eat. And the feelings may be mild at first, and then worsen every few days, and that's because your pregnancy hormones are undergoing a rapid increase in their levels. Nausea typically, but not always, improves by the 12th to 14th week. Moms with twins have a lot more pregnancy hormones and so they're more likely to experience a lot more nausea. Well, here's some things that you can do when you want to prevent vomiting or nausea. So, first thing in the morning, Eat some dry crackers before getting out of bed. So keep them by the bedside. What you wanna do is then put them in your mouth, let them slowly dissolve, and then wait five to 10 minutes and then get up very slowly. You can also try eating small amounts of food frequently throughout the day. That makes make sure that your stomach is kind of half full all the time. Because when your stomach's empty, that's when you're gonna feel nauseated. So try a bite or two of something small, doesn't have to be big, every one to two hours. Don't eat a large meal on an empty stomach because it's just gonna come right back up. And then if your prenatal vitamin makes you feel nauseated, do take it before bedtime. So I have more tips to ease nausea. 
Um, I had a lot of morning sickness in my pregnancy, so, oh my gosh, I know how difficult it is to function. But here's some tried and true things you can do to feel better. You can use ginger, ginger, cookies, ginger, ale, ginger, tablets, ginger, ginger, ginger. Um, you can do an old scuba diving trick and put the ginger between your uh, lip and your gum. That way you don't have to swallow it. To get uh, more fluids, try juicy fruits like watermelon and cantaloupe or juicy peaches or pears. You might try flavored popsicles. Now here's another trick that I learned when I worked in the intensive care unit. If you've been really sick and you've been vomiting, take equal parts of water and a clear juice like apple juice or like uh, white grape juice or even pear. Mix them up together, so one part water, one part juice. Then take one teaspoon, just a teaspoon, that's just five cc's, take a teaspoon and swallow that. Now, that won't even get to your stomach. Your body will absorb it in your esophagus, but slowly it'll increase your blood sugar levels and you'll start to feel better. Now, if that doesn't work and you throw that up, that's when you want to call your healthcare provider. You can also try dry toast, dry bagel, Melba toast, and I found a lot of benefit by using acupressure with C bands. So, when to call your provider? Well, if you um, have been unable to eat or drink anything for six hours or longer while you're awake, do call your provider. Or if you've been experiencing vomiting or diarrhea for six or more hours. We do have prescription medications that are safe in pregnancy and that can help you when you're feeling very nauseated. Well, let's um, switch gears, shall we? And let's talk a little bit about exercise because this is a question that comes up all the time. A lot of my patients want to know whether they can exercise in pregnancy. And it's a good question because in many parts of the world, when a woman becomes pregnant, she's advised not to move. She's advised to lie down for most of the day and not exercise and not move because of fears of harming the baby. Well, I can understand that. This is very well-intentioned advice. However, it's actually not healthy for the vast majority of moms who are pregnant. So do get some exercise and don't be afraid to get up and move because your baby is very well protected. And if you have anxious family members who've been advising you to limit your activities, do check with your provider and you can even sometimes have your provider talk to them because we rarely advise women not to exercise. So if you've been exercising regularly before you became pregnant, that's great because your conditioning, your stamina, and your strength will help you and your baby in so many ways. In addition to being a great way to help your heart, lungs, and muscles get ready for labor, Exercise also helps keep your blood sugar levels lower, it helps prevent constipation, it will improve your mood and outlook, and it sure makes it a lot easier to get a good, night, a good night's rest. Pregnant moms who exercise are also more likely to keep their weight in a healthy range and have enough energy and stamina for labor. So exercise, you don't have to run a marathon. It's as simple as taking a walk. So don't give up. If you can't join a gym or you don't have enough time to do a full hour, remember, we live in a guilt-free zone here with Nurse Barb, and so any exercise is better than none. Now, as your tummy grows, the ligaments that hold it in place will stretch more, so you may want to look for a belly band or a supportive pair of underwear uh, to make you feel more comfortable. So let me give you some exercise guidelines now. Um, remember, even if you've never exercised before, it's never too late to start, but I want you to go slowly and gradually increase the time and intensity of your exercise. Walking is just as beneficial uh, and maybe safer than running or jogging. So let's try just walking for 10 or 15 minutes, maybe three to five times a week, and then gradually increase the time you spend walking until you can comfortably walk for 45 to 60 minutes every single day. 
you'll feel so much better in so many ways. Now, if you're working and you're commuting and 60 minutes just seems impossible, then count your steps. Try to walk as much as you can at work. Get up from your desk, take a break, walk around, um, walk during your lunch hour, try to park your car farther away if you're doing any errands. Just try to get a lot more uh, walking in. But if you're gonna be outside, I want you to wear sunscreen because pregnancy hormones can cause your skin to develop dark spots and more pigmentation on your upper lip and your cheeks, and this is known as the mask of pregnancy. So anytime you're outside, do use some sunscreen. So what's recommended? Well, we talked about walking, but cycling is fine as long as you're wearing a helmet. You can hike, you can do yoga. Swimming is awesome because there's no weight bearing. Um, you can do some low impact aerobics. Um, and again, check with your providers if you have any concerns. What's not recommended in pregnancy are any kind of exercise where you could fall or you could hurt yourself. So even if you're an experienced horseback rider and, or an experienced downhill skier, we don't recommend it because the issue with falling is, is so big. No rock climbing, of course, no scuba diving because of the oxygenation and the amount of nitrogen that that you would get. We also don't recommend any kickboxing for obvious reasons. So let's talk a little bit now about car travel and commuting. I know that a lot of women in our audience travel uh, one, two, or more hours every single day just commuting to their jobs or school. Many others travel for work regularly or on vacations. Whatever the case, traveling by car, bus, or airplane is generally considered safer. He Stop. Whatever the case, traveling by car, bus, or airplane is generally considered safe for healthy pregnant women. But as always, consult your OB provider before any extended travel or talk to them if you're planning to travel in your third trimester. Now, if you're going to be sitting for an extended period of time, it's best to take breaks every one to two hours by getting up and walking around. A quick visit to the bathroom will prevent your bladder from becoming too full, and it also helps with circulation. If you're flying on an airplane, it's important to flex your toes up to your knees and then point them away regularly. That helps prevent uh, blood clots at any time when you're traveling, but especially when you're pregnant. So airline travel um, can be kind of stressful if you're traveling for work or you're trying to visit a family that lives far away. Um, do get some guidance from your OB providers if you're traveling regularly for work. But I've got a lot of tips for you because I, I log a lot of miles out of um, SFO. So make sure you have everything you need in your carry-on bag in case your luggage gets lost or delayed. That means packing extra snacks and extra water. Of course, you're going to wear a seatbelt, and if your tummy's too big, ask, ask the uh, flight attendants for an extender. Try to get a seat with a little extra leg room so you can stretch out. Do avoid caffeine and, of course, avoid alcohol. Um, you can try to request an aisle seat and then bring an extra pair of loose fitting shoes because your feet are very likely to swell. Again, plan to get up and use the bathroom at least every two hours. Control recommends that pregnant women not travel to areas where Zika virus is present. Um, now, if you live in or have already traveled to an area with Zika, you want to uh, take precautions against getting uh, bitten by mosquitoes. If you have any symptoms of Zika virus, you'll need to tell your healthcare provider. And if you have been traveling to an area where Zika is prevalent, do talk to your healthcare provider about that. There, the guidelines for Zika virus are changing all the time, so it's best to check uh, with the current guidelines in case you're listening to this at another time. So let's talk about what to stop in pregnancy. Um, and you see smoking, alcohol, and recreational drugs. So we know 
as healthcare providers, it's very, very common for people to smoke, use marijuana, alcohol, or other drugs, not just recreationally, but to help reduce their anxiety or help them sleep prior to becoming pregnant. And they may find it very difficult to just stop cold turkey once their pregnancy test comes back positive. And yet all of these things increase the risk of miscarriage, of bleeding, of having a smaller baby, of premature delivery, of babies having developmental delays, and other serious complications. So do talk to your healthcare provider if you need help stopping these substances. You know, I just want to mention that many women have a lot of embarrassment and a lot of shame when they're using these substances. Um, and they want to stop, but they may not feel that it's safe to share this information with their OB provider because they think they're going to be judged. But I want to encourage you to talk to your OB provider because we've heard these kinds of stories all of our careers and we're here to support you and guide you toward being as healthy as possible and help you find the resources you need to help you decrease or stop any of these substances. Now, a lot of my patients uh, want to know if just a little alcohol is okay in pregnancy. And with alcohol, the truth is we just don't know how much alcohol is too much alcohol for each unique mom and her baby. That's why it's recommended that in pregnancy, a woman not have any alcohol at all to minimize any possible risk to her baby. Foods to avoid. Now, I know in pregnancy it's a time when every mom should try to eat a wide variety of nutritious foods for optimal health. There are some foods that are more risky because during pregnancy, a woman's immune system changes in several ways that enable her to carry the baby. This means she's much more susceptible to becoming very sick from spoiled or contaminated food. In addition, whatever the mom eats may also pass more easily to the baby who's so much smaller and less resistant to toxins and or bacteria. So because a developing baby is so vulnerable to possible harm, it's best to avoid foods that have high levels of certain chemicals or are more likely to contain bacteria or parasites. Now, You've probably read some stuff online or talked to friends and gotten some conflicting advice. And people say, no, that's fine. You can have this or you can have that. But the issue is that uh, all of the things I'm going to talk to you about have been identified repeatedly and recently as being very risky for pregnant women. And all of them have been associated with causing very serious harm to children, including miscarriage. And the confusion comes about because, you know, someone with very limited experience and knowledge of their own pregnancy um, is giving you advice that's very different from organizations that gather data from thousands of women. So my advice is to always use trusted sources of information. When it comes to your health and the health of your baby, there are plenty of other healthy, tasty, and nutritious options available to eat. So why take the chance of eating something that could be dangerous? Because fish may contain mercury or other contaminants, it's best to limit fish to no more than two servings a week. And for more information, I recommend seafoodwatch.org on what seafood is safe. And if you're, if you're a seafood lover like me, you can also check with the Environmental Protection Agency at epa.org. Now, there are some foods that are a lot more likely to contain bacteria or parasites, and those include unpasteurized juice, raw meat, raw fish, and raw shellfish. Now, if shellfish is cooked properly, it's not considered harmful. However, if fish is raw or undercooked, it could contain bacteria or parasites that are impossible for you to see and can be harmful to the mom, which could cause a miscarriage or an infection in the baby. When it comes to unpasteurized juice, I don't want you to have fresh squeezed juice that's available at most of the farmer's markets because we don't know if that fruit 
that's being used is what we call dropped fruit. That means fruit that's been uh, laying um, in the soil where there's fertilizer and sometimes the fertilizer contains E. coli. So if you want fresh squeezed juice, you can buy the fruit and then wash it thoroughly with soap and water um, before you juice it. So let's talk about soft cheeses now. Brie, feta, blue cheese, goat cheese, camembert, gorgonzola, and Mexican soft cheeses. All right, that's a lot of really yummy cheeses that you probably love. Now, even, even if the label states that it was made from pasteurized milk, these types of cheese have all been shown to contain a dangerous bacteria known as listeria, which has been associated with miscarriage, and it's also been associated with children having issues. So even if the label states that it was made from pasteurized milk, these are all soft cheeses, which means that they can harbor or have a dangerous bacteria in them called listeria. This has been associated with miscarriage. Now, it's also recommended that pregnant moms not have some deli meats like salami, and liverwurst because these are cured, they're not cooked. The slicers at the deli counter may also have dangerous bacteria. But if you're craving a deli sandwich, ask for it to be heated thoroughly or look for something cooked like a hamburger. And make sure any hot dogs you eat are also well cooked. What about herbs to avoid? Now I'm Italian, so I cook with a lot of herbs like basil, parsley, cumin, coriander, and many, many more. However, there are many herbs that can be harmful to the baby or even start labor. So please check with your OB healthcare provider for more guidance if you have questions. But this is a partial list of herbs that should be avoided in pregnancy, especially black and blue cohosh, cascara, mandrake, tansy, mugwort, yarrow, uh, and senna. This is just a few of them. If you see an herbalist or you buy traditional Chinese herbs, I want to caution you to be very, very careful because there's a longer list of herbs that can be dangerous in pregnancy. Now, a lot of my patients have grown up hearing about hot foods and cold foods or sour foods that can lead to miscarriage, including eggplant, papaya, sesame seeds, and others. I want to reassure you that consuming small amounts of these foods is considered safe in pregnancy, but you may have family members who are not going to be convinced. Remember, a lot of these traditions started before refrigeration, and it's very possible that those foods were ones that spoiled uh, rapidly in the past. So it's understandable that people would want you not to have them, but those foods are considered safe. What about medications to avoid? There are many safe over-the-counter medications that pregnant women can safely use. However, it's important to avoid aspirin and non-aspirin pain medications that contain ibuprofen or naproxen. These are known as NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and they should be avoided. These can cause bleeding or complications for the baby. Now, sometimes women with certain autoimmune issues or high blood pressure will be advised to go ahead and take a baby aspirin every day, but this is not something that every pregnant woman should do on their own. If there's some pain, then Tylenol, which is also known as acetaminophen, is generally considered safe. Some other things to avoid are cats, cat litter, and soil. Now, I know you love your cats. I like cats, too. But even if they're indoor cats, their poop or their feces can contain toxoplasmosis, which is a very harmful parasite. You can pet with your cat, you can play with them, but changing the cat litter is off limits for you. This parasite, toxoplasmosis, is airborne. So do not change cat litter while you're pregnant. And if you can, put your cat litter box into a room where you can close the door. Toxoplasmosis can also be found in soil, so if you're going to do any gardening, I want you to wear rubber or leather gloves. Um, it's also found in undercooked beef or pork, so again, make sure beef and pork are well cooked.
In pregnancy, it's also important to avoid using hot tubs and saunas because this can raise your core internal body temperature way, way too high, which can be dangerous for the baby. As moms, we regulate our temperature by sweating, but your baby is surrounded by warm amniotic fluid. So you can take a nice warm bath, um, but if you're sweating, it's too hot and you'll want to cool off. Now, speaking of temperature, if you do have a high fever that is one over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then do call your OB healthcare provider for advice. So what should you limit when you're pregnant? Well, caffeine. Now, I love coffee and I love tea, uh, but these are stimulants, so we'd like you to limit yourself to less than two servings a day. When it comes to artificial sweeteners, uh, not enough is known about their effects, um, but most experts agree that they're probably safe and many women have been using them for years with no known effects. When it comes to nuts, there's a lot of evidence that you should have nuts unless you yourself are allergic to them. So you don't have to avoid eating peanuts, um, because uh, your baby's likelihood of having a peanut allergy develops on their own, not from any prenatal exposure. But of course, as always, if you have any questions about nutrition, do consult with your own OB healthcare provider. So now let's talk about a topic that most couples are very interested in, but maybe a little embarrassed to bring up uh, with their healthcare provider. So, Every couple I've ever met has questions about sex during pregnancy. And most women and their partners can continue to have sex. It's very normal and natural for both of you to have concerns and questions. And you guys may be having some very conflicting feelings about having sex or the frequency. In general, for healthy pregnant women, sex is safe and it does not harm the baby. It's completely normal to have a lot more interested in sex. It's also normal to have a lot less interest in sex or mixed feelings about it. In pregnancy, there's a lot more blood flow to the pelvic area and hormonal changes can lead to larger, firmer breasts, which may increase your interest and enjoyment. It's also possible that you may experience more powerful orgasms in the first and second trimesters. So watch out for that. It's just as common to have less interest in sex. If your breasts are tender, if you're nauseated, if you're fatigued, maybe you're afraid, may make uh, the idea of sex completely out of the question. And of course, it's normal to have mixed feelings about sex. Open communication is very important for your relationship. If you're not able to talk to your partner in a way that feels comfortable, then do talk to your OB provider for some resources and guidance. So many couples have questions about oral sex. For pregnant moms who are receiving oral sex, it's a nice way to be intimate and have fun. Just one important note about oral sex, and that is partners should not blow air into the vagina, as this can cause a very rare but very serious complication known as an air embolism, which can affect both mom and baby. So when it comes to sex, Especially if your breasts are getting larger, you may feel very sexy and very attractive. But it's also normal to feel like your baby's watching you. It's normal to feel unattractive, especially if you're starting to have stretch marks or varicose veins. It's also normal to feel guilty or awkward or uncomfortable and worried. It's Unfortunately, it's a lot easier to have sex than to talk about it, but it's essential for both partners to feel that they're being heard, respected, loved, and supported. And that's not always the easiest thing to do and can be especially challenging when a woman is pregnant. With hormone levels that are changing, a body that's growing, and a new baby to prepare for, everyone, and I mean everyone's sexual relationship changes. It's normal to wonder if it's safe to masturbate or use a vibrator or be self-sexual in pregnancy. The same guidelines apply to women who are with a partner and to those who are self-sexual. 
When it comes to relationships, partners may feel unsure about whether sex harms the baby or if their partner is as interested in the sexual relationship as more of her focus turns toward her baby. Partners often say they feel guilty for wanting to have sex. And many times in a relationship, whether the couple is pregnant or not, one person is more interested and comfortable having sex than the other is. So couples can experience a lot of tension as one person tries to persuade or convince the other one that sex is okay, let's just go ahead, while the other's just not interested. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not always men who are more interested in sex. Sometimes they're a lot less interested, and a woman's sex drive may be more than her partner's. No matter whether you're more interested or less interested, you are perfectly normal. The key is to talk to your partner about what will work in your relationship. And as your pregnancy progresses, be creative with position changes and other ways to be intimate together. You may find that gentle hugs or caresses can be a sweet substitute for intercourse. Just as you're nurturing your baby in pregnancy, it's so important to feel loved and nurtured by your partner. So when shouldn't you have sex? Well, do not have sex if you've had vaginal or abdominal pain, premature labor, have a vaginal or urinary tract infection, do not have sex if you have blood or fluid leaking from the vagina. Don't have sex if you've been advised that you have placenta previa. That's when the placenta is over the birth canal. And don't have sex if, for whatever reason, your OB provider has advised you not to. So we're going to switch gears now to nutrition. In the first trimester, your baby is teeny tiny and will take what it needs to grow and develop from your body. So you don't have to worry as much about nutrition now. Make sure that you're supplying your body and your baby with the very best and healthiest nutrition so that you'll thrive during pregnancy. So if possible, do take your prenatal vitamin every day. And you may try taking it before you go to sleep. But if it upsets your stomach, then just do the best you can. Um, maybe take it every other day. Um, if you are unable to take it, do talk to your OB provider for specific advice. Remember, try to eat every two to three hours, even if you're not hungry. Try to eat small, healthy snacks or half-sized meals more frequently. This will help keep your blood sugar le levels stable. It will help prevent headaches, and it helps decrease nausea. Try to get three to five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. So you want a lot of color on your plate. So you also might want to think about grazing, and that means not eating an entire large meal. Instead, just have little bites or sips of food throughout the day. You might try like a quarter of a nutritional bar or a couple of crackers, maybe a few sips of milk or drinkable yogurt or, you know, a spoonful of rice. Anything is better than nothing. So... We say a lot to a lot of moms that even when you're not hungry, try to feed your baby. Try also increasing your fluid intake by having at least six glasses of water per day. I'd like you to avoid soda and fruit juice as they just add empty calories and they fill you up and they increase your risk of diabetes. So we have a first trimester to-do list. This is a list of things that are important for you to do once you find out you're pregnant. That means you want to pick an OBGYN provider, and you can use the uh, Find a Doctor link on the El Camino website. You want to be sure to have your prenatal lab test done. You're going to consider whether to have NIPT and carrier testing. Those are some tests that we talked about in webinar number three. I also advise that you keep a journal, write down your thoughts and feelings because it will change from day to day, week to week, and month to month. And it's really nice to share that with your child when they get a little bit older. Now is the time to call your insurance company. You don't want any surprises when it comes to insurance, co-pays, and deductibles. 
you also want to try to rest as much as possible. Remember, you're growing a new life, and that requires about as much energy every day as it does to run five miles. You do want to try to exercise if you feel up to it. And the last thing is you kind of have to surrender to some of the body changes and have a good sense of humor about it. When it comes to the rest of your pregnancy, it's never too early to start thinking about where you want to deliver your baby, gather a list of pediatricians, find out about breastfeeding and childbirth preparation classes. So when should you call your OB provider? Call if you're bleeding, if you have any severe headache, if you have any severe abdominal or pelvic pain, if you've been vomiting or had diarrhea lasting more than six to 12 hours, and call them if you have any concerns. Once your first trimester is over, you're gonna head into your second trimester, and this can be a real fun time in your pregnancy because nausea improves, your appetite comes back, and you're gonna to seem to have a lot more energy. This is the time in, that most people consider the, the glow of pregnancy. Your tummy's really gonna start popping out, and it's possible that you'll start to feel your baby move at about 18 weeks. So what does El Camino Hospital have to offer besides these wonderful webinars that we've come up with for you? Well, they have a lot of things. This is where I delivered my baby, and I hope you'll consider El Camino Hospital for your family too. And after this webinar, we'll send you a resource guide uh, that includes information about how to choose an OB provider. What's nice about El Camino is that we welcome midwives and doulas and other community resources. Don't forget, there's the Find the Doctor uh, link on the El Camino website, and you can find culturally appropriate referrals to providers who speak your language. You also have access to our Health Library Resource Center. What I really appreciate about El Camino Hospital is that we have made some real inroads for specific health concerns for people who come from India and South Asia uh, where diabetes and heart disease are much more prevalent. We have a South Asian heart center. We also have the Chinese Health Initiative uh, and that helps us care for people who are at much higher risk of having hepatitis. We also have on-site translation services for families and patients and a variety of yummy foods in the hospital. Uh, no matter where you're from in the world, chances are we're gonna have some food that you'll like. We also have support classes offered throughout pregnancy and during your journey as parents, including childbirth preparation, new parenting classes, CPR for infants and children, and the breastfeeding classes. We also have lactation consultants who visit every single mom after delivery, and we have a lactation center with both appointments and uh, drop-in help. And finally, uh, what's nice is there's also private delivery rooms with very comfortable fold-out beds for partners and family members. Wow, we have come to the end of our webinar. And just to recap, we've covered so much today from your emotions when you first find out you're pregnant to what to do for nausea, travel, exercise, sex, um, and why El Camino Hospital is a great place to have a baby. I hope you found this uh, helpful. After this webinar, you'll be receiving an email with links to this and all the previous webinars, as also as well as a link for the resource guide. We're going to also send you an evaluation and please fill that out because it really helps us design our next set of webinars for the future. So I wanna thank you again for joining and now I think it's time to answer some questions. Sounds like a plan. So Barb, we have a question. Do I need to see a doctor to get an ultrasound? Yes, it's uh, important for you to see a healthcare provider to get an ultrasound in your first trimester. However, once you've determined that you're pregnant, you can go and get an ultrasound uh, through many other agencies that some will even come to your house and do 3D ultrasound. Wow, that's really improved. Technology really has made a difference. Here's another question. I've never heard of anyone having an issue with sushi. Do I really have to give it up? 
Well, I'm glad you asked this question because there have been many issues with having sashimi, um, which is uncooked fish. Now, if it's cooked fish, that's fine, but with sashimi, there have been uh, several outbreaks of uh, parasitic infections, and it is associated with an increased risk of miscarriage, so I would recommend against it in pregnancy. I've heard that it's okay to have one glass of wine a few times in pregnancy. Why all the fuss? You know, it's interesting what we hear from other people. The fuss about alcohol in pregnancy is that we just don't know what the amount is for each individual woman. So for some women, it's very, very possible that they can have a glass of wine or two during their pregnancy and have absolutely no effect on their baby. While another woman with a different genetic makeup, that would be devastating for her child. So that's why we make this sort of all-encompassing advice. Do I have to modify my exercise too? So if you're a personal trainer or you're a professional athlete, um, what I would tell you is that you're much more likely to deliver slightly early and a smaller baby if you don't modify your exercise. So if you continue exercising at your same level, you, you may run that risk because it just takes so many calories for you to do the work that you do. So I would encourage you to talk to your OB provider, check your weight regularly, make sure you keep your heart rate um, at a level that your provider is comfortable with, and then get your regular ultrasounds. I've heard that I shouldn't color my hair, is that true? Well, I'm here to tell you during pregnancy you can color your hair. There's probably absolutely uh, no problem for your baby. Likewise, you can get your nails done. But if you're someone who works in those industries and you're around a lot of fumes from uh, coloring other people's hair or doing nails, I'd encourage you to try when you're pregnant to be closer to an open door, keep the area well ventilated, and take a lot of breaks. Well, Barb, we're running short on time, so we're going to end tonight's webinar and say thank you, everyone, for attending. We really learn a lot from each other during these events. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thanks for joining.